54 fugitives. Tonight, America's Most Wanted goes to California in search of Edwin Smith. Police say 10 years ago, this gang leader committed double murder. But witnesses were too scared to come forward. But now that's changed, and the manhunt begins in the City of Angels on this special edition of America's Most Wanted. Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm John Walsh. Here and everywhere, high school can pass. Police say Edwin Smith pursued the violence of gang life. Ernie Pickett wanted to be a doctor, and he excelled in school. They came from two different worlds, but one day, their paths crossed. Ernie was my uh, the only male child. He was very wise for his age. Ernie had such a, such a smooth personality. My neighbor described him as being a person who was like a light bulb. He was, he shined brightly, but you never knew he was around because he didn't make noise. Ernest Pickett Jr. was hardworking and popular. He was an honor student and a varsity baseball star at Dorsey High in South Central Los Angeles. He had his eyes set on a medical career. And on Friday, January 20th, 1984, he had a lot to look forward to. The Boston Red Sox were scouting him. UCLA had accepted him. What's up with the necklace, man? Teresa gave it to you. Ah, Teresa, what's up with that, man? You guys I told are... you we're just friends, man. Like I told you, school is number one. one. Baseball is number two. But girls, number three. <laughs> I got this fool cut. Edwin Smith was the same age as Ernie. That's where the similarity ended. Police say Smith was a dropout and a gang member. He was a crip, known in the neighborhood as Black Ed. Give me a match, man. Police say Smith entered the school grounds that Friday around noon. He seemed to be looking for trouble. Like Ed, you're gonna be cool, right? You're gonna be sweating me. Anybody mess with me, be punching the wrong clock. Dorsey is primarily a blood school. That, uh, that is that um, the majority of gang members that go there are bloods. Although there are a few crits, but they keep a very, very low, low profile. Police speculate Smith saw an opportunity to challenge the bloods on their own turf. Hey, man. You seen baby Trey? Hey, what's going on, man? Nah, not yet, man. We're looking. Police still don't know what set the gangs off, but by 2 o'clock, members of the Bloods were also congregating outside the high school. School let out at 2.15 that day. Ernie was planning on catching a ride home with a friend so he could quickly change clothes and rush off to baseball practice. We all represent over here. What is it about here? What's up, Go back and listen to this, punk ass. You don't want it. Come This doesn't look good. Somebody get some help! Ah, somebody help! 
Police say bullets fired by Edwin Smith killed a 25-year-old gang member and fatally wounded 17-year-old Ernie Pickett. Ernie was shot in the back. Doctors could not save his life. My husband met me at the door and he said, uh, come on in, honey. We have some bad news for you. And uh, I knew it was Ernie. I don't know, I don't know how I knew, but I knew it was Ernie. I didn't have any idea that he was dead. Chris Harris joined family and friends. In the beginning, the entire today. community Shooting rallied the around the Ernie's day. mother and family. The story was big news, and there was a strong sense of outrage. The gangs decided that they would go to school of all places to have a war, to shoot at other people for a short period of time. Soon, Edwin Smith, the prime suspect, was in custody. Student eyewitnesses told police they saw Smith kill Ernie Pickett. It looked like an open and shut case. But when it came time for the preliminary hearing, no one stepped forward to testify. The students were scared to death. Some said they were threatened with retaliation if they spoke up. They just let you know not to say anything. So they didn't have to tell us what they would do, hurting somebody or killing somebody. It didn't make any difference to them. If they said, don't say anything, you didn't say anything. On April 4th, 1984, the court dismissed all charges against Smith. He was free. No one bothered to tell Ernie's parents to come to the hearing. Mrs. Pickett Allen was gripped with despair. I didn't think I had anything to do as far as helping to catch my son's murderer. I was so naive as to how our criminal justice system worked that I just kind of laid down and moaned and, and groaned, you know, uh, for a few months. I needed to be around people that had experienced some of the same thing that I experienced. He took the life of our daughter, and he should never be allowed out. My name is LaBertha Pickett-Allen, and my only male son... Mrs. Pickett-Allen Pickett threw herself into the victim's movement. Uh, somebody here said about people forget. We can't afford to let people forget, because you'll never forget. You'll never forget. Uh, Letha was talking about pain. She became a founding member of Justice for Homicide Victims. The organization works hard to make sure the criminal justice system doesn't forget the victims of violent crimes. I'm here as the father and the voice of my precious son, Tom Myers. She had found a solution to her pain by working with others. So we share our sorrow and our pain, but we also share information, pertinent information information she hoped would bring her son's murderer to justice. 200 people writing letters. For nine years, Mrs. Pickett Allen waged a determined campaign, talking to anyone who would listen. So your son is dead, and no one will be held responsible. No one will be held responsible, and they know who it is. Does that make you furious? Furious is not the word. I've been on talk shows, I've been on radio shows, I've been to Sacramento, I've gone to governor's conferences. See, once the victim is dead, nobody thinks about them. Nobody but those family members. Mrs. Pickett Allen refused to give up. In January of 1993, she wrote a letter to the recently installed L.A. police chief, Willie Williams. What impacted me about this letter and a couple others I received is that it reminded us that the loss of a loved one, the fear, the concerns, the anger uh, of that loss never goes away. That really urged me as a chief of police, uh, you know, as a father, as a parent, to make sure that we left uh, no stone unturned in trying to bring this to a fair and equitable resolution. Chief Williams reopened the case. Detective Carolyn Flamenco was assigned to the investigation. I said to her, I said, now I think that something really will get done because they have assigned a woman to this case. Detective Flamenco was a mother herself, and a bond developed between the two women. It spurred on the investigation even when old leads kept coming up cold. <laughs> Flamenco had earned a reputation for successfully investigating cold and unsolved cases, but this one became her greatest challenge. Potential witnesses had changed names or moved out of state. Many were still afraid of gang retaliation. Others lacked credibility. something was going to happen. 
a lot of the witnesses that I located had severe drug problems or um, extensive criminal backgrounds. So I just had to keep going and keep going until I found more witnesses. The murder of Ronald Miller last October was like two Then in October 1993, the women's worst fear came true. Police say Edwin Smith had killed again. Is uh, Edwin Oswald Smith. The victim was 33-year-old Ronald Miller, and like Ernie, he was shot in the back. Police say Smith was heavily involved in cocaine trafficking. He was now 26, a seasoned criminal on the run, and another family was devastated. I am still in denial. I hurt very deeply. My family hurts. My daughters are afraid. Uh, she calls him Mad Dog, and we call him Ed Dog. I think he has lots of different aliases. But, uh, you know, if, if, if justice had been served at that time, her son might not have had to die. You know, um, at that time, there were over 300 witnesses out in front of the school. One witness finally came forward after Mrs. Pickett Allen gave a speech at a halfway house about her struggle for justice. And she said to me, I was there. And she started crying. I said, you were where? And she said, um, I was there when your son was murdered. Detective Flamenco tracked down a second eyewitness now living in another state. The former students were now mothers themselves. They responded to Flamenco's emotional appeals and agreed to testify. When Officer Flamingo came out and talked to me, you know, we mainly talked about our kids. I know how, you know, I would feel if somebody shot my kid. I would want him caught because I have children. In November 1994, so. Detective Flamenco had collected enough new evidence to make her case. Nearly 10 years after the shooting, police recharged Smith with murdering Ernie Pickett. Today, Mrs. Pickett Allen is grateful to the people who helped, but the heartache will never go away. I don't believe it's something you can get over. Somebody told me when your children are little, you carry them on your knee. When they're older, you carry them in the heart. Well, I've had to bury Ernie in my heart. Mrs. Pickett Allen has waited more than 10 years to see her son's accused murder brought to justice. Help us find gang member Edwin Smith. He's wanted on three counts of murder. Smith is 29 years old, six feet tall, and 185 pounds. May have grown his hair long, may be wearing a full beard and mustache. Smith has several tattoos. The letters RTC on his left arm, the number 30 on the right arm, and Harlem Crip on his left forearm. His nickname is Black Ed. He sometimes uses the alias Jeff Lewis. We say he makes a living selling drugs and has a very violent temper. Los Angeles police believe Smith may be on the run with this man, Kenneth Richardson. Both are wanted for the murder of a man in 1993. Kenneth Richardson is another Crip gang member who goes by the alias Kenneth Boyd. If you've seen either one of these men, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Coming up, the story of a family man with a dangerous secret life. Touch, a huh? bizarre ending yeah, to a terrifying, terrifying evening. You really like me, huh? I think he thought what he did was okay. He thought it was part of the date. I want to go home. Las Vegas, Nevada, 1978. Joseph Mancini and a woman we'll call Jane were returning to her house after their first date. So, uh, we'll keep in touch, huh? Maybe I could see you a second time? You really like me, huh? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll see you later. I'll call you. Look, uh, you sure you're okay? Yeah, sure. Isn't that a great view? Best view in town. I love this place. It is. It is. 
I thought we were going home. We will, we will. Just, uh, just enjoy the view. I want to go home. Take your shorts off. <laughs> You're kidding, right? I am petrified. I'm thinking, oh my God, I hope someone sees us. Can I scream? Can I run? What he did was okay. He didn't think of it as a rape. He thought it was part of the date. And I thought if I convinced him that I liked him and that it wasn't that bad, that it, he would take me home. And we had talked about, you know, maybe going out more often. Jane's quick thinking worked. But in providing police with details, all she could remember was Mancini's first name. She knew any break in the investigation might have to come from her. Hi. It seemed like a couple yeah, of weeks okay. had passed by. I hadn't heard anything, but he called. I couldn't believe it. I thought, here's my chance. So we set up a date. Okay, if you act suspicious, just let him in. We'll take over. A team of Las Vegas undercover officers were there to chaperone. Everyone, I think, wasn't expecting him to show but sure enough there was a knock at the door and it was joseph hey how you doing hi hey nice to see you again you do hey you look real good thanks my mom maggie and my father rick hey how you doing you have a very lovely daughter you should be real proud of her and these are some friends of my parents good how you doing how's it going great so, Mr. Alberson, uh, what line are you working in? Construction. Yeah, there's a lot of that going around town. Me, I'm a dealer. Blackjack, raps, over to Union Plaza. Las Vegas Police, you're under arrest, pal, for the rape of Jane Halverson. Hey, what is this, some kind of a joke, huh? Yeah, right. Hey, get out! Hey, hey, hey! Freedom is rights. You have the right to remain uh, silent. You have the right to an attorney. You can't afford one when it'll be a police. Uh, uh, I wasn't feeling lucky tonight. Police would soon suspect Mancini of eight rapes, but since no one knew his real name, the father of two young girls had the perfect hiding place in the suburbs. The question became, when would he strike again? Next, they say the wife is always the last to know. This was held in a grip of fear. Jane's rape had fit the pattern of a suspect police had dubbed the Green Valley Rapist. And although police still didn't have Mancini's last name, they were closing in when 
two of his victims came up with similar license plate numbers. All right, get this. Two of the victims remember the letters, CN or CNS. We ran a check, found a Joseph Mancini with a Lincoln license, CN 3621. Does this guy have any priors? One about eight years ago. We got photos. He's our man. That's him. July 4th, police had finally tracked Mancini down. They were waiting when he returned home from a picnic. Why can't we go see the fireworks? Your father is tired. Why can't it be tired any other night? I've been so tense lately. You sure you're all right? told them the truth yet. I just want to know why. Joe, what's wrong with you? I knew you'd think it was me. It's not me. You don't understand. I had to do what I did. They were just no good, Janet. All of them. Oh, my God. But I still love you. I always have. I'm going to get out of here and things are going to be the way they were. No. No, they can't. Janet refused to see her husband again, and Mancini drew a lengthy sentence at Nevada's Gene Prison. But that didn't stop him from thinking about his future. Rugged but caring and gentle 22-year-old seeks lasting relationship with mature but sexy Asian female between 18 and 25. What do you think? You're 22 years old. This is a club mid. Anyway, by the time you get out of here, you're them bras with your grandmothers. That's what I think. Yeah, well, who asked you? Let's go, Romeo. Cell inspection in 10. Mancini placed personal ads in newspapers everywhere, using the prison's P.O. box as his return address. I was a sergeant at Gene Prison. Joe Mancini was an inmate there. Joe Mancini was um, a warehouse clerk and had um, minimal supervision. On March 19, 1987, Mancini took his job transporting packages one step further by transporting himself. The van belonged to prison warehouse supervisor Charles Stevenson. This is Stevenson, open the gate. So 
no one searched it as it left the prison. I was um, concerned that somebody had, had escaped the institution and uh, that they were out on the street. The first reaction is to um, try to find out where they might have gone. And where Mancini went was here, Catalina Island off the Southern California coast. Ironically, Lori Roberts also went there for her honeymoon on July 4th, 1987. There was some, a man across the street that had a, you know, long sleeve shirt on and long pants, and it, it just caught my eye, having been in law enforcement for so many years, it was just kind of peculiar to see him there. So I kept looking, kept looking, and I started to get a really uncomfortable feeling in my stomach. That's Joe Mancini. I'd know his face anywhere. So he said, well, grab your badge and your ID, and we'll go and see what we can do to find, you know, a deputy sheriff. Not seeing one, Lori approached Mancini, and after introducing herself and her husband as tourists, she started leading him to the sheriff's station by herself. So I was trying to, you know, keep the, the whole, you know, ideal that he didn't know me from prison because basically, uh, you know, most of the inmates don't recognize officers when they're out of uniform. And so we started walking as we were walking down the strand in the stores. I remembered that the sheriff's substation was behind the store area in the parking lot on Catalina Island. You know, I'm having the hardest time remembering your name. What is it? Bob. Uh, Bob Atwater. No, no, that's not it. It's Joe, isn't it? Joe Mancini, I remember. How's it going? Fine. Uh, some friends of mine are having a party just up the street. You want to go? Hey, look, can't you guys just let me go? Well, we're just going to go to a party. It's going to run. You know who I am, don't you, Joe? You're going back. It's all right. I'm a Nevada State Prison Sergeant. Call the Sheriff's Department. Hey, hey, look, I don't want any trouble. Mancini is vain and tries hard to be cool. Those who know him say he loves to dance, especially to music from the 50s and 60s. Las Vegas police want to hear from anyone who may have responded to one of Mancini's personal ads. Mancini could be in the Northeast. He has family in Pennsylvania. And police believe he could be working at a casino in Atlantic City. If you recognize Joseph Carl Mancini, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. When we return, the story of one of our fugitives who was looking for a rewarding experience. Stay with us. He told police he was wild. California is dotted with peaceful little towns. The picturesque town of Laguna Beach is about 50 miles south of here. And residents there thought they were far enough away from big city problems. They were wrong. For years, artists have captured on canvas the warm sunlight and beautiful seascapes of Laguna Beach. It's known as a friendly community where people look out for each other. Laguna is a very close community, and particularly downtown, people really know each other. It's like living in a small community, which makes it very unique for Southern California. It was that serene lifestyle and caring attitude that attracted 62-year-old Frankie Rashti and his 53-year-old wife, Cece, when they fled their turbulent homeland of Iran. They were looking for a simple place to lead a simple life. Eventually, with a little savings, they opened this Baskin-Robbins ice cream store. They're just like best friends, you know, just married, and they, they always work together. On the night of February 20th, Frankie and Cece were tending their business. 
But just 20 miles north in Costa Mesa, a one-man crime spree was already underway. Police say a young man would rob three stores as he made his way to Laguna Beach that night. His first stop was this flower shop. They kept saying over there, don't shoot me, you know, just I'll give you whatever you want, just don't shoot. His second stop was this store, only a few miles away in the same town. Ten minutes later, on the same street, he um, held up a uh, video, a Blockbuster's uh, video music store. At approximately 9.10 p.m., he had traveled to another city just uh, northeast of Costa Mesa. His third stop was here, a Baskin Robbins in Tustin, where he was caught on tape pointing a gun in the clerk's face and demanding cash. Then police say he set his sights on Laguna Beach, where he found Cece and Frankie getting ready to close their Baskin Robbins for the evening. He observed the individual pull a gun out, pointed at Mrs. Rochdy and indicated he wanted to register. Mrs. Rushdie uh, might have stated no, or she was in disbelief what was going on. And the next thing that happened, a shot rang out, striking Mrs. Rushdie in the front of the uh, throat area. Frankie Rushdie then tried to stop the robber by attacking him with the only weapon he had, a mop handle. Frankie was seriously wounded. Another employee who watched the horror unfold made this chilling call to 911. Be advised it's a possible shooting. Mrs. Rashti's jugular vein was hit by the bullet, and she died a short time later. Her husband, Frankie, survived the attack. Her murder was the first Laguna Beach homicide in 27 years. The community rallied behind the Rashti family, many actively working as volunteers to keep the store open. It was their way of battling their shock and anger that one of their own had fallen victim to violent crime. I'm just very angry about the victimization in America today. I think there's no reason for it. And I'm, I, I think it's terrible that some very hardworking people could just be shot for a couple of hundred dollars. I think it's wrong. The people of Laguna Beach will miss Cece Rashti. And tonight they're asking for your help in finding her killer. There aren't many clues, only these surveillance videos from the robberies. Take a good look. Here's the video we showed you earlier, taken the night of CeCe's murder. Also, police believe this videotape, taken three weeks earlier, may also be the alleged killer. He's Hispanic, in his early 20s, about 5 feet 7, with a medium build, dark eyes and hair, with a mustache. He has heavy, old English script tattoos on his neck and a teardrop tattoo under one of his eyes. If you have any information, call us tonight at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Our operators are standing by. Tonight, another of America's most wanted is behind bars. Your tips help deputies track accused killer Gerald Voiles till he couldn't take it anymore. He gave in because you never gave up. Is this for Mr. Walsh? I'll admit I was happy to see Gerald Voiles in shackles after 14 years on the run. But that was nothing compared to the reaction from the family of one of the men Voiles is charged with killing. Oh, we're real happy. I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. When I first heard that, man, I was about ready to jump up and down because we'd waited so long to hear that he was God. The hunt for Gerald Voiles began in 1981 when police began tracking a notorious auto theft ring. William Crumley's son, Anton, had the misfortune to be at the wrong place at the wrong time when the suspected car thieves discovered an informant in their midst. I didn't have nothing better to do, so I came along. I hope you don't mind. Of course not, Anton. The bodies of Anton Crumley and the informant were found one week later in a quarry. They'd been shot to death. Several of the men involved were arrested and charged with murder. But police say one man got away, Gerald Voiles. We stayed on the case, profiling Voiles three times. Finally, two weeks ago, the pressure from your tips ended Voiles' life on the run. During all the shows, I think there were some over 500 calls that came in about 75 that we think people had actually seen him 
and gave us good leads that led to him turning himself in because everywhere he turned around, we were there. And he just finally got tired of running. At 9.20 on Sunday morning, the 5th of March, Gerald Boyles presented himself at the jail information booth in the Polk County Jail. Boyles actually had the arrogance to try to pick up the $3,000 bounty on his own head. He asked if he could collect a reward for Gerald Boyles, and the jail employee asked who he was. He said, I'm Gerald Boyles. Boyles isn't getting the reward, but after 14 years on the run, he will get what's coming to him. In my opinion, it's time to pay the price. This morning, I, I, my husband went out and got the newspaper, and I was going through the newspaper, and, and I read this article. Uh, man goes to jail, does not collect $3,000. So when I read that, I thought, this is something else. All these years, 14 years, he goes free and turns himself in to try to collect $3,000. <laughs> I don't know how anyone can sleep with their self when they shoot somebody in the back, and then they can go through life living free and happy. That would haunt me for the rest of my life. When we come back, a cheerleader who hitched a ride with some homeboys, but never made it home. We're constantly walking a tightrope, balancing the rules they need with the independence they crave. But sometimes all we do to protect our children isn't enough. All it takes is one bad night. Our next story is about one mom, one child, and one night. Jolie Watson, a 17-year-old cheerleader in Los Angeles with a promising future. She made good grades in high school, had good friends, and was looking forward to graduating this June. Her mother remembers just how special Jolie was. She was so loved, and, and she had a heart of gold. She was the essence of all that's good in this world. She trusted everyone. She loved everyone. There's nothing Jolie wouldn't have done to help someone. She was so proud of being a cheerleader. She worked all summer to help pay for her uniform. Last year on the night of October 28th, Jolie wanted to go to her high school football game on the home field at Dorsey High. She couldn't join her fellow cheerleaders because of an ankle injury. So she sat in the bleachers and rooted for her team. I just had a bad feeling and I told her, I said, Jolie, I have a bad feeling that something bad's going to happen. Please come home. And then I said, please come home early. She says Jolie laughed and promised to come home early. Friends say she left the game to meet up with three young men. She invited these girls to go with her. They asked us not to identify them out of fear. What did she say to you? Do you guys want to come kick it with me and my homeboys? And we said, um, I said, yeah, we'll, I have to see how they look first before I go, you know, off with anybody that I don't know. When the guys pulled up in the parking lot, the girls didn't like what they saw. So they decided not to go with Jolie that night. I was telling her don't go, but she was like, these are my homeboys, so she knew them. I told her I wasn't going, and she was like, well, um, well, I'm going to be home um, early. After Jolie left her friend, she somehow ended up here at this apartment, which remains largely untouched from the way it was that night. When police arrived the next morning, they found Jolie's keys by the door, the walls riddled with bullets, and there on the sofa, they found Jolie. She'd been shot twice in the head. Around 10 o'clock in the evening, we hear some shooting from my apartment. I just live in the back of this apartment. And uh, that day we came out, because we heard the shooting, and we just saw two people running away from here, uh, one chasing the other one with a, some guns. A combination of fingerprints and informant tips led police to this man, 25-year-old Carlton Maurice Gladden. Police say he's the trigger man, and that he sold drugs out of this drug house. The house was a, a marijuana location where Marijuana was being sold through um, a window. A screen was cut out. It was bars on the window, and then they had cut a screen out about three inches wide to transpose marijuana and hands and money through that, that space. -age. Police, family, and friends don't understand how Jolie ended up in a dangerous drug house that night. Was she lured there? Was she kidnapped? How did this young lady wind up caught in the crossfire? She was not known to use drugs, and an autopsy found no drugs in her system. 
The police have identified the house where your daughter was found as a drug house. What do you think she could have been doing there? Oh, there could be so many reasons. There could be a million different reasons. You know, Jolie was very trusting. She could have went somewhere to um, do a favor for Sal to transpire. We've all done things as teenagers and look back and say, oh my God, you know, how could I have done that? She, she didn't deserve to lose her life. A week after her murder, Jolie was laid to rest in an emotional service. Angered and confused over Jolie's murder, friends are still struggling with their loss. They say they won't rest until Carlton Maurice Gladden is captured. He's gonna pay for what he did to Jolie. But as long as he's out there, I mean, I feel like her death is, I feel like her grave is being spit on every day that he's free. If you had a chance to talk to Gladden, what would you say? I hope his family is listening because he has no idea what he took from this world. She was like the glue that kept our family together. She was my life. Carlton Maurice Gladden is from Belize, Central America. He's five foot nine, weighs 135 pounds. Gladden usually wears his hair in this jerry curled style most outstanding physical feature is a wandering left eye. If you know where Carlton Maurice Gladden is, call us at 1-800-CRIME-TV. We'll be back with more from Los Angeles. Stay with us. One girl's courage sent police to the rescue. Her courage saved lives. She had been shot at least once. She was able to use her head completely, call a 911, and then report what happened. So I, I, I find that, that although it was survival, but I, I find it very heroic. Now, here's a quick review of tonight's cases. Edwin Oswald Smith is wanted for three counts of murder. Los Angeles police are also looking for his accused accomplice in one of those murders, Kenneth Richardson. The FBI and Las Vegas police are looking for Joseph Mancini, who they say is a serial rapist. This unidentified Hispanic male is being sought for questioning by Laguna Beach police in connection with the murder of Cece Rashti and several robberies. Los Angeles police want Carlton Maurice Gladden for the murder of a 17-year-old cheerleader. I'm John Walsh. Good night from Los Angeles.